that campaign to prevent the culture uh, proper. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, that in other countries, I think uh, we did some um, collaboration research yeah, with the provincial government and, and also the police. Yeah. So for the academy, the academicians like us, then uh, they have a contact with the uh, provincial uh, governor and then and there's a head of the transportation agency, yeah. and then the head of the traffic police. Yeah. Then uh, we collect the data, and then uh, after we analyze, we show to them, and we uh, say to them that uh, we should do like this, we should, uh, did, uh, we, we should uh, change the policy like this yeah, to them. And then uh, on the field, they, they will do like that. So the result of study, uh, doing the study, we did the collaboration, and then after that, uh, they uh, implement the, the policy uh, by the local government. So uh, we, yeah, I think in the future, we should do like this for all the countries, because the pandemic sometimes is coming and then gone. So in that case, we have to make a cooperation and collaboration. Academician and then the government should be working together. And the society, there is some uh, organization, like uh, in Indonesia, we have the Transport Society. Indonesian Transport Society, what we call as MTE in Indonesia, it's Masyarakat Transportasi Indonesia. And in this case, we have uh, a collaboration to do some research and the policy and then apply by the company. Although in some cases, in some areas, may not work well, yeah. but mostly uh, work well, especially in the international, uh, Indonesian level, international level, yeah. we have a good collaboration between the Indonesian Transport Society and the Ministry of transport. It is a good uh, collaboration research and then uh, apply it to the regulation by the Ministry of Transportation. I hope that I can answer your question. Can I say like this kind of research will be the really important tool for the government? Yeah. Yeah. Very important. Yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. So much. It's very interesting. interesting. Thank you. Check, check. Yes, yeah. All right. Thanks for the question and thanks, Mr. Vishaksano, again. Uh, any question left in the meeting room before we proceed to the question in the chat box? Okay. I suppose no. So here we go with a question from Ms. Alisa in the chat box. Dear Doctor, mm -hmm. thank you for the amazing presentation. I would like to ask about the impact of the maintenance of transportation since the transport has been reduced. As well as the innovative vehicle like the Toyota company where, where they are concerned about the electric car, yet the, size of the society is not ready yet. What is the impact of this innovation? Thank you. So there is two questions here from Marisa. First is about uh, the impact of the maintenance of transportation. Yeah. Uh, first, the, the number of uh, passengers is reducing, then the number of uh, transport mode, bus, railway, airplane even, is uh, reducing. Then how the maintenance? I think maintenance still has to be first concern especially on the airplane. The airplane, the, the safety is very much important. So the maintenance, uh, I do see that uh, some uh, operators still have concern on maintenance of the, the transportation because uh, if they didn't do the maintenance, then it will affect to the accident. The accident, of course, will costly much to the company.
company that they operated. So uh, most of the time we see that the, the, the operator still do the maintenance of the, the vehicle. But maybe for the uh, local public transport like uh, minibus, yeah. in that case maybe yeah. some of the uh, uh, drivers and the owner are not willing to change the component, the part of the that may be broken or something like that. But for the big company, they still uh, put considerable uh, maintenance. For the innovative vehicle, the top company, uh, they can say about the electric car, that is the site not ready yet. I think the education, yeah, education is the most uh, important thing. In the future, I think people will uh, notice that the how the importance we are using the electric vehicle because we reduce the number of air pollution and it will affect to the, our society and the uh, um, quality of living of our society. Uh, right now in Indonesia, some electric vehicle is already sold and some people are willing to buy the electric vehicle. And we saw some YouTubers that are promoting the electric vehicle. So we hope uh, that uh, people will be put more emphasize on using the uh, electric vehicle. And they know the benefit of uh, electric vehicle to reduce air pollution. Again, thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks for the question and thanks for your response, Kavir Saksono. Any further questions among the participants? Please go ahead. You may raise your hand, maybe type in the chat box, or you may just ask right away. Otherwise, I will declare the end of this second keynote session. Right, I still see none. So I would like to share a bit on, on the water transportation sector uh, affected by the COVID-19. Yeah, uh, uh, long, long story made short is that, well, cargoes are still being transported by cargo ships to, by sea lanes nowadays. Uh, and see the, the people who work on those, those ships are the seafarers. Sometimes they sign a contract here in Thailand but they have to fl fly to get into the ships elsewhere, like Japan or yeah, elsewhere. And it is a big issue because re travel restrictions make them unable to travel as such. Both, uh, the, both go there and get back. And some of the ships even stranded in the sea because the restrictions at ports of some countries that impose such measures. Yet a meeting back in May among ASEAN member states as a big pool of seafarers yeah, addresses this issue and kind of kind of reached some recommendation together back then. So I guess that is for now for for this session. So we can have a 10 minutes break and we can start at 11.15 with the third keynote speech session by by Professor Nira. Mitra and my colleague Mr. Pichet will take the role of the moderator for the following keynote sessions. So thanks again Mr. Vishaksono and thanks again participants. We can have a break for now, 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Dr. Pichitra Takun and Dr. Ahmad Vichatsono for the keynote speech. And I would also like to thank for Mr. Sinabat Mandarin for leading our first discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to the second discussion. But before that, let's take the break time for 10 minutes first. So please take a break for a while.
Corona case, we can relieve the formality a little bit here. Mr. Fichet, would like would you like to say hello to our participants a little bit? <laughs> All right, I guess not. <laughs> okay, enjoy the break, distinguished participants. Thank you again.
Lu masuk aku Kasih ininya, linknya update dulu dong Tak tunggu dulu Gak ada, gak ada yang aneh Gak ada yang aneh kalau aja mau gue apa Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back again. Now we are really going to the second session that will be moderated by Mr. Pichet Munpa. He is currently a student of doctoral degree of Environment Development and Sustainability, Chilokon University. He is also the expert of environmental and social safeguard and risk mitigation of worldwide Foundation International. Mr. Pichet, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we fight, Mr. Pichet.
chat mo na pa. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, distinguished guests and participants. Uh, it's such an honor to be with, the, with all of you today as the moderator uh, for this session. So in the next uh, one or two hours um, uh, now on, uh, we are going to discuss and listening to um, you know, the experienced practitioners and um, uh, lecturers you know, who are very expert on this field. So I would like uh, to introduce to all of you uh, our first keynote speaker for this session, uh, Professor Nira uh, Abminitra. Um, she is a professor uh, and former head of the University of Delhi's uh, Department of Social Work. Uh, she is a respected uh, professor with um, over 35 years of teaching experience. Uh, the professor has written numerous um, books and multiple articles uh, on a variety of topics uh, such as social work education and practice, gender of course, which is the main topic for today, environmental action, disaster management, uh, gerontology and social work, uh, values and ethics in social work and research, as well as health and education. Um, she will give us a talk on, you know, the topic around gender and disaster risk reduction. A uh, professor, I heard, you know, um, me, me, many progress out there, you know, um, in terms of uh, international frameworks, the implementation on the ground uh, regarding gender and disaster risk reduction. Uh, for example, referring back to the uh, general recommendation 37 of the Convention on the Elimination and All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, ZDO in short, it makes a really, really clear direct link uh, between um, disasters, um, pandemics, and women rights, uh, providing you know, our governments the guidelines uh, to um, implement how to make sure that gender equality is, and women's rights um, you know, are central to uh, disaster risk reduction and disaster management, as well as humanitarian response. So, and, and in light of COVID-19, this is you know, especially true uh, to see many actions uh, taken by you know, states and civil society organizations out there. So um, in the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, uh, could you enlighten us more um, you know, um, by sharing your perspective on this topic? Uh, gender and disaster risk reduction. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very good morning uh, to the distinguished audience. At the outset, uh, let me thank the Asian Academic Society for uh, giving me this opportunity of interacting with uh, you know, scholars and academicians and practitioners and policy makers. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, partly on account of the fact that by training as a teacher, you know, I am not too much into uh, PowerPoints because I feel that, you know, if I speak with an eye contact with the audience, I think it serves me and the audience better. Uh, so, uh, you know, I thought uh, I was given a choice to speak on subjects and I thought that, uh, you know, I would choose... Uh, gender and disaster management and issues and share some issues and perspectives with you. Um, as the moderator has very rightly said that, you know, although gender has been considered to be, <clears throat> it has been deemed to be a very important component in the entire, you know, disaster risk reduction and management. Yet we find that, you know, this understanding or this cognition has not really permeated into practice at the ground level. You know, you I'm sure some of you do know that uh, New Delhi is hosting the Fifth World Congress on uh, Disaster Management. And uh, partly on account of that, I was also very, very busy because that Congress is uh, beginning from the 24th to the 27th of uh, December, and uh, sorry, November. And if you really look at, you know, I was just trying to review and analyze the participation and the representation of women. If you look at even the scientific and the technical, uh, you know, advisory committee, one finds that the representation of women is less than optimal, right? So while we are talking about gender mainstreaming and, you know, we are talking about gender equity, etc., but even in the most exclusive circles, I should say, say of academia and practitioners, 
you know, yesterday I was addressing um, another, uh, you know, we had a webinar on um, uh, community-based disaster preparedness, and I was the only woman expert in the, in the panel, you know, the list of panelists. So we can understand that there is still a very dire need to, you know, in, to really actualize, uh, you know, disaster, equi uh, gender equity and uh, gender mainstreaming in the realm of disasters. You know, in, uh, if I was to just look at the context in which we are placed today, you know, disasters have, you know, the nature, the frame, the intensity and, you know, the magnitude of disasters has really changed over the past you know few decades um, the humanitarian emergencies they're becoming more complex right they've become more longer lasting they're becoming harder to address and we are you know facing a lot of compounding and interrelated environmental um, you know disasters which also bring in their wake socio economic and political crisis so it is not just the disaster per se, whether it is natural or man-made. There is a series of cascading effects that every disaster brings in. And, um, you know, our approaches have still largely remained stereotypical, you know, silos-oriented, fragmented, and largely inadequate to deal with these very new types of emergencies and contingencies that we are experiencing one after the other, you know, very, in very rapid succession. And of course, I'm sure in your conference, you will be talking about, you've talked about COVID. You know, it's been a very unprecedented pandemic and it has entailed a very protracted crisis with waves of infections which have been spread over several months and it is still going, you know, it is still going strong. We don't know where it will end or whether it has an end at all. So, and apart from the very severe health impact and very heavy mortality, it has also brought so many threats to human life and livelihoods, right, across the globe. Um, in the overall context, I would say that these newer disasters are tending to, you know, impact more and more, you know, larger masses of people by way of their social, psychological, economic, environmental shocks and disruptions, and which are only leading to increased risks and vulnerabilities of people now of course disasters impact communities you know universally they do but their impact on certain uh, you know vulnerable and marginalized constituencies the impoverished persons women of course specifically speaking children pregnant and lactating mothers persons with disability older persons you know this is a realm which needs special focus and attention I mean, we were trying in the Congress also to have a special plenary on <coughs> psychosocial impact of disasters, you know, because disaster management still continues to be a realm which is dominated by the structural engineers, the geologists and the geographers and the seismologists and what have you. There's a long series of, you know, specialists who control this whole realm of disaster management, right? And you know that how much of you know, social sciences and social science intervention is also needed, you know, to, to tackle the other very, very severe social psychological impacts of disaster, which, which continue for, you know, uh, uh, long after the relief and response cadres have gone away. So, and, uh, you know, COVID has, uh, I mean, COVID, of course, nobody wanted COVID, but the only thing that COVID has done is to you know bring home the fact that social and economic disparities have led to differential impacts on distinct categories of people and you know what they have done is it is not that disaster vulnerability comes only through disasters or within disasters it is just that disasters bring to surface they manifest the pre-existing deeply embedded structural inequalities the inequities the systemic defects that we've been living with right but we've not been paying attention to so they have somehow you know because of these this exposure to the deeply embedded vulnerabilities probably society government civil society is now more driven you know towards focusing on these human dimensions and focusing on looking at how these differential impacts are impacting people you know very differently not only are vulnerabilities different coping is also differential so um 
in all of this and i would also include climate change because climate change is also creating newer and newer types of contingencies and the impact is we've not even been able to understand or take it into cognition the the very widespread impact that climate change you know wreaks on different constituencies and women definitely right in every because we say gender cuts across it's a cross cutting theme across development so uh, you know placed as we are in these very very confounding times it is very imperative that we give importance to equity and inclusion which is something that we've not done you know adequately in terms of risk reduction or in terms of managing disasters and we include the marginalized segments by bringing these vulnerable groups including women to the center stage of planning and you know management whether and in every phase of disaster management the pre disaster phases the planning preparedness mitigation and the you know post disaster relief response recovery rehabilitation etc etc and we have to make disaster preparedness and management participatory and inclusive it is at you know it is mostly rhetorical that we talk about these issues for example at this conference or in the other conferences that you will be having and i will be having but whether this rhetoric is actually getting converted to practice you know is something that we need to work at much more you know as an academician and a, as a practitioner that has been the endeavor of you know our my department and the university to create you know um um uh, community based disaster preparedness initiatives and to engage youth you know because youth you youth needs to have a big stake in in resolving some of the issues that society is going to be confronted with so engaging youth in disaster management in in building community build, you know based organizations etc in a big way uh, you know in a series of for example right from the bhuj earthquake in gujarat to the kashmir earthquake to the kosi disaster in bihar you know the kerala floods in the recent context in india so we've been trying to engage the university youth in trying to you know bring that human element in the disaster management frame now uh, i'm sure i don't have to say you know uh, your audience is very distinguished and you know what is gender and gender is a social construct and you know it determines what is expected what is allowed what is valued in a woman or a man in a given context and it also determines the opportunities it determines responsibilities it determines resources and resources how resources are allocated it determines powers which are associated with with being you know male and female men and women <clears throat> now gender does not mean women you know so many times because i also take a lot of um, you know faculty development programs in the university of delhi and across uh, universities across india on um, you know gender and gender sensitization and i find that in most of these courses or in most of these programs there is just a handful of men so you would have a room full of women in 30 women you would have about four men and they would also be very rarely sitting in their chairs not knowing what to expect and then comes up Uh, uh you know uh, a feminist they would you know because an, i'm an academician and i'm a woman so without even opening my mouth and being to be like somebody who's going to bombard the men with a lot of feminist uh, you know jargon <laughs> so <coughs> i'm sorry i have a little bad throat so in in such a context you see we have to understand that gender is also to do with men and it is not that women have their special vulnerabilities and capacities we have to also understand that in the disaster context men also have vulnerability you know there are a lot of expectations from men also which lead to socio psychological economic impacts and we have to configure that also but since you see uh, women are marginalized and you know so therefore a lot of times when we talk about uh, and they've been traditionally and culturally marginalized so a lot of times when we talk about gender and disasters you know we tend to focus more on women but i want to you know bring to note bring to attention the fact that and gender also includes the third gender you know somewhere we need to also integrate their perspectives vulnerabilities and capacities in the whole paradigm now you know when we uh, when you look at gender let me just dwell a little bit on how gender um, you know permeates in in a disaster context 
and uh, it is a critical dimension of society and in the disaster context it becomes even more critical and like i have just you know said a little time a little while ago it has been largely it had been largely undermined in disaster scholarship and in disaster practice now uh, you know so human and man made disasters both they do not just cause developmental challenges they have long lasting impact on these less privileged survivors who have limited resources to cope with disasters and to re even recover from disasters uh, disasters definitely they affect uh, women and men very differently because they have distinct roles that they occupy they have different responsibilities that have been given to them in life and because of their differences in capacities needs and vulnerabilities they are very differently positioned in terms of how they experience disasters how they engage with disasters i mean even if you were look to look at you know women and girls boys and men if you look at them you know different uh, belonging to different age and socio economic strata even they have their distinct vulnerability if we disaggregate gender because women do not constitute you know a homogeneous constituency so when we say women getting impacted even within women you have the most underprivileged the most marginalized right so the poor women the rural based women the women from the social you know socially marginalized groups for example in india we could have the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes and you know the forest dwelling communities etc the refugees right so you would have women also as you know placed a little better or a little not so good so again they have higher social and economic vulnerability they suffer proportionately larger losses in disasters and conflict situations and they have very limited capacity to recover uh definitely you know across gen across women their vulnerability is connected to their lower socio economic status and you know just as i can say it for india i can say it for even the other developing countries and even the developed countries you know for that matter based on local culture and practice women in developing countries still you know are largely without educational attainment or minimal educational attainment you know skills financial um, independence so in other words they have less power you know access and control over all types of resources <clears throat> now uh, in india you know although we have the inheritance rights for women but women are not claiming these inheritance rights right there is still a, a gap between what is there in the legislation and what is actually happening in reality so women have you know very less access they do not hold property rights land rights they have less of a political voice and less mobility also due to cultural restrictions for example you know in india you have a lot of cultural practices it's a very culturally diverse country as are the other countries you know and so there is a still a lot of gap between a goal for school going girls or attaining school enrollment for girls and them actually getting completing their education because dropout rates remain high girls are still married at an early age the problem of dowry doesn't go away right and in in the overall context they do occupy a subordinate position vis-a-vis -vis men due to the predominantly patriarchal practices which limit their opportunity uh, again most in, in india you know as uh, is also common in the rest of the developing economies agricultural work livelihoods within the primary sector small home based enterprises in which women are engaged these are specially subject to many types of hazards even climate change you know so they are specially susceptible to liable to losses which are incurred in the wake of disasters um this leads to a loss of household production and income including that of the backyard economy and small businesses which are run by women from their homes a lot of times the women farmers they lose food security when disasters destroy crops they destroy seeds and livestock you all know that you see when food is scarce um 
who is the worst impacted or when water is scarce not only are women you know engaged in drudgery driven uh, you know food fuel water um, uh, collection activities because of culture you know they also tend to eat the last they tend to eat the least right they would always give preference to the males in the family as a result of that undernutrition malnutrition you know water scarcity you would i mean you will be appalled i'm sure many of you do know that sometimes there is you know a lot of women in india suffer from constipation because because of two reasons one of course is that you know they are not drinking as much water as they should and secondly which of course due to now prime minister modi at least that problem is easing out because of open defecation that women could not you know not having toilets in the houses made them you know control the bowel movement in a manner that they could not you know respond to nature's call as spontaneously as men can right so a lot of health impacts are also there on account of these disasters which are also climate induced you know changes which are happening and uh, uh, you, you know so women are tending to bear the brunt of many of these uh women depend on domestic activities and they depend on an informal economy and therefore you see any displacement any loss of household resources um, lack of adequate support systems they affect them more than men while men may migrate right uh, for jobs um, you know pre disaster or post disaster women are tied up with their traditional responsibilities and they face greater social and economic insecurity after disasters as compared to men and to top it all you know what is also happening in most societies is that the traditional family systems are breaking down right the community based support systems are also breaking down or they are changing and this is leading women in peril because the social capital depleting is not a good thing for women so the traditional support mechanisms which women have are also diluting and diminishing leaving women more you know uh, impacted as compared to men further <clears throat> you see women because of cultural norms which i have already specified or biological conditions because women bear children you know they have reproductive and maternal health concerns and also the socio political environment all of these uh, you know limit the opportunities that women have to access support services so during relief and recovery pregnant women lactating mothers you see etc they are not able to access relief or even you know other uh, facilities which are extended and it is most of the time that men get to access them and we've had a lot of opportunities where we've seen that you know uh, in this whole garb of the household being considered as a unit for relief response rehabilitation the women are sidelined especially you know the female headed house the females who are heading households the widow the elderly and you know i'm not generalizing but in a lot of times when when this this relief and response goes to the woman it is invested in the family if it goes to men there have been illustrations where it does not you know it is spent by the men on specific needs it does not come to the family right so in that sense also their access to relief and recovery and uh, you know compensation packages etc also uh, in, you know in conflict situations women are scared to come out women are scared to reach out to access uh, and again that impacts their recovery that impacts uh, you know their ability to regain their confidence even after the conflict is over so there is also a gender division of uh, labor you know which is which for women is more intensive it is drudgery driven driven it is burdensome and in disasters this increases manifold right uh there are, we've done a lot of studies where we found you know we've done daily diagramming and we've done seasonal diagramming for women's tasks and we find that women are working for you know 18 hours 19 hours in a 24 uh, hour day so drudgery you know and during disasters because they have to forage for everything for their family the drudgery and burden goes up widowhood you know widows elderly women like i've already said age plays a very important role in vulnerability across you know the women's 
developmental cycle. So while young girls are impacted differently because come a disaster and the girls are the first ones who are withdrawn from school systems because they become carers. You know, they have to look after siblings and and uh, reopening of the schools is the last to go go back to school if they ever do. So even girls are impacted. It's not that only middle-aged women are impacted or elderly. So every age category has its distinct vulnerabilities, you see, which uh, increase during disaster context. And they face you know, a series of socioeconomic uh, disadvantages. Uh, again, women tend to suffer more injuries, right? Data has shown that they suffer more injuries. They die more frequently in most disasters right um, reasons many many reasons are there uh, i have worked in the hail districts you know in the central himalayas i've worked with in garhwal and kumau where you know you see and it's a very you know that the himalayas are, are seasonologically very active you know, these are very fragile and, and very prone to earthquakes and uh, we were working on disaster reduction and um, you know when we were doing mock drills etc we found that women wear such cumbersome restrictive clothing right and so much of jewelry which is a part of the culture right i mean i put a bindi because i choose to because i i belong to a category of women who have a choice right if i don't want to wear it i won't wear it but for a lot of women you know wearing those you know big things and then no those nose pings and their huge earrings and the the lehengas the skirts and the dupattas which culture imposes on them you know so how can in the event of an earthquake how do they run with this restrictive clothing how do they manage you know with those heavy anklets and all of that they are they have to be decked you know perpetually because they're living in a cultural context which is so dictatorial right so imposing so it prohibits them from running fast. They work inside houses, right? So in earthquakes, they are the ones who are, you know, embed, I mean, they are the ones who are impacted when the, the roof collapses. Men are mostly outside. So a lot of times you will find, you know, we've also heard of instances where in floods, if there are, uh, you know, male children and female children, uh, the, the focus is on saving the male children. And, you know, the female children or the females uh, come later, which is such a tragedy. I mean, it is such a basic, uh, you know, human right that everybody has to survive. But, uh, you know, we looked at examples where if, if a man is swimming with a male and a female child and he's not able to swim, the male child gets the first preference. <clears throat> so, um, you know, women also take a lot of risk because... Uh, a lot of times, you know, when we talk to women, they say we didn't leave the house because our husbands were not home, right? So they need permission even to leave home. Uh, then they will say we didn't leave home because, you know, my elderly in-laws were there. And since they could not, uh, I could not rescue them, I also did not go out. Or, you know, I was just trying to, the whole, uh, you know, responsibility of the saving the household goods, saving the likes, livestock, I remember I talked to one woman who was severely, uh, you know, injured. And I said, why did you not run? There was, she said, no, I was trying to save my cow. You know, cows in India are revered. You know, they're looked at, you know, as mothers. So she said, no, you know, my, my, my cow Mata was inside the house. And how could I have left without the cow? So she was trying to, you know, take the cow along with her. So there are so many restrictions which make them, you know, more disaster prone, make them more vulnerable. Then culture, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, I'm sure it happens in your countries also. But in India, every village you go to, you will find, you know, these small pools where, um, you know, children are swimming. Now, because of culture, boys can just take off their clothes and jump into a pool of water, you know, or a pond of water and learn swimming. But girls don't have that opportunity. How many girls and women know how to swim? And so in floods, who dies? It is the women who die. How many girls are encouraged to, you know, climb trees? It is supposed to be so unfeminine, so masculine. You know, you have these gender divisions. And so they can't save themselves. So these are small things. If, if girls were also taught swimming or if they could also, you know, uh, undertake all of these um, activities, probably they would save themselves much better during disaster context than they do in the present uh, uh, context then 
COVID has also revealed this and we all know that uh, you know there is an undue burden on women and girls for doing this unpaid work for providing care water and food for households because they are responsible for these domestic duties looking after children and elderly and livestock and the persons with disability they don't even have time for self care or to even access health services and they stay back in hazard prone areas maybe you know when men will migrate to safer zones because the elderly parents are there the livestock is there la the land is there so again all of these are making women more vulnerable then they have very restricted um, you know access to information and technology we are in a in a in a realm where there is a lot of information boom there is a lot of communication technology but still you go into the hinterland and you will find that access of women to information and technology is more in namesake rather than real right i mean when I mean, you have countries where radios and tvs are also not accessed by women who are working you know indoors and uh, uh, they have no access to or very little access to warning information so they don't know whether you know a disaster is coming and so they 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 don't find uh, you know opportunities to save themselves to 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 be better prepared to face uh, disaster management trainings are happening all across the country but if you really look at the numbers you know we need sex disaggregated data to show how many women are getting these trainings i mean is it the men who are accessing science and technology and information and all of that also the training sensitization or are women also you know purposefully are being made made part of these disaster training workshops pro training programs etc that's also important you know then the most important thing um, is also that you know in any humanitarian crisis whether it is a, a war or a civil strife or a or, you know or a refugee context or a natural disaster uh, any complex emergency gender based violence right that's a huge gender based violence against women and girls is tending to be very very high and more severe you know when i teach students i teach a course in disaster management and i often at the beginning of the course ask my students that you know who do you think is the first responder in a disaster context and my students being social work you know uh, neophytes they would always say community you know because we are so focused on community based disaster resilience and so i tell them no you know the first responders are usually the human traffickers they they are the first ones who reach a disaster scene you know locale because they are always looking for victims so so unfortunately you know women and girls are still uh, subject to a lot of violence of all types uh, including sexual violence human trafficking domestic abuse this is known to increase exponentially during and after disasters and you know as housing is destroyed <clears throat> or becomes unsafe in the instance of many disasters uh, families have to resort to shelter living and shelter living again impinges very very heavily on women's safety on women's privacy and um, on their overall well being because you know cramped living living in close proximity to others that can escalate that does escalate sexual violence and abuse for female survivors and sometimes and unfortunately very very sadly when women don't have any other access they are forced to also sexually gratify men to receive aid to receive support right to receive the much needed help for their families and for their children so um, again and one last uh, you know uh, vulnerability that i wish to also talk about but i just did you know when i was talking about the world congress is the psychological impact women you know studies and studies have shown that women have they suffer from higher functional disabilities they suffer from a higher psychological impact like emotional disorders uh, distress and post traumatic stress disorder right and a um, lot of riots and civil strife and you know studies which have been done show that women have ongoing and continued problems you know they re experience the traumatic events uh, they are accompanied by symptoms of avoidance hyper arousal right 
uh, we see a, we've seen you know when we were working in kosi we saw a lot of spontaneous miscarriages happening to women we saw a lot of stillbirths premature deliveries you know all of these related to the reproductive roles that women perform and how stress and trauma leads to all of these issues which are again stigmatized they be there you know because a woman is stigmatized when these problems happen and not the man so again the the do there's a dual impact on the woman who not only loses a, a baby but also you know loses face and is um, stigmatized on account of this and uh, there is still a lack of mainstreaming of psychosocial support uh, and uh, you know rebuilding support mechanisms uh, for uh, women survivors of disasters and uh, you know a lot of times in the post disaster context everybody just wish you know there's a huge hue and cry to restore business and to restore livelihood and physical infrastructure but nobody looks at the long or the short term and the long term needs and interests of women and families those are somewhere sidelined and that is unfortunate a lot of times you know there are a lot of early marriages which happen in the post disaster context because suddenly everybody feels that you know they want to get over their responsibilities and girls have to be married off so a lot of a uh, lot of instances of early marriages happen uh, again outstanding debts loans that leads to a lot of economic damage which again impinges more on the women than on the men right and um, and they are they, these kind of impacts occur across you know, all types of hazards um can i just know how much time i have do i still have an, another 10 minutes or so uh, yeah uh, professor if you can finish and wrap up in 5 minutes that will be all right. right all right all right and so you know how covid has also shown that uh, uh, the, the the disaster impacts Uh, have been exar uh, you know they have been aggravated for women and girls by virtue of their sex um so how do we and how, now let's come to how how do we perceive women in disaster context you know if you look at any disaster and if you open the newspaper the first image that you know you get to see is a, an old woman carrying a small baby on her head in a basket so you know which says so much about how are you looking at women you will not find men being pictured right as disaster victims it is usually the most vulnerable women who become the faces of disasters and we are still you know <clears throat> looking at women as victims and not as survivors and this this radically needs to change <clears throat> there needs to be a radical change in the perception you know how we perceive women because women have their distinct expertise they have their distinct traditional and indigenous wisdom of coping when we were working with kosi disaster victims we found that you know floods are a uh, are an annual recurrence of course some floods are you know now huge floods but women have their own experience of coping so why don't we configure that in our disaster preparedness mitigation and response strategies rather than focusing on outside experts coming and giving their lectures on scientific ways of managing and responding to disasters so this is something that you know we need to look at women finding a greater role and across you know so when it comes to people at expert levels people at the mid middle levels people at the grassroots levels the community Uh, you know based disaster management cadres at the grassroots level at every level somewhere we need to put in women you know i don't know how we are going to do that but there has to be a persistent effort to to create that kind of a gender mainstreaming you know you all know what is gender mainstreaming i and gender mainstreaming is not only in the context of disasters it is a cross you know Uh, every aspect of development it is integrated in the uh, sdgs and the mdgs etc and uh, again we need to have a gendered analysis right we need to understand the roles responsibilities opportunities risks and vulnerabilities in a gender disaggregated manner based on that we need to you know uh, gender mainstream in in uh, disaster reduction and of course a lot of experiments have been done but these need to be you know brought to fore they need to be replicated because a lot of very good grassroots practices are happening but you know they are not coming to the larger realm for them to be replicated and for them to be you know spread across the realm that is not happening 
so we need uh, you know a greater equality um, of course adequate accountability mechanisms are required to monitor progress as far as gender mainstreaming because you know just don't think that it is happening you need to have systems to see whether it is happening to what extent it is happening we need identification of issues and problems so that gender differences and disparities can be diagnosed early and then responded early we we should give up the assumption that issues or problems are gender neutral they are not right they they there is a gender inequality and therefore a gender equality perspective has to be configured and definitely a clear political will allocation of adequate resources are needed because you know you you give the least resources to gender you know to to looking at gender in disasters so adequate resources for mainstreaming uh, you know financial human resources so that the concept can integrate into practice so um, in other words you see you need to foster awareness about gender equity to help reduce the impact of disasters you need to also um, you know look at how um, you know differences in women and men's perception also need to be shared men have to be you know have to understand the perceptions of women and women have to understand the perceptions of men so gender equality doesn't mean that you place women above men but you know they have to be placed at an equal platform and an equal footing so um, and overall you know you cannot look at gender mainstreaming in disaster if you don't look at you know, the whole issue of women's empowerment you know, which means ensuring opportunities for women in science and technology which means building the capacity of women's groups community based organizations including gender mainstreaming in communication in training in education right um, of course we need to sensitize you know people who are there in disaster response and mitigation political representatives in terms of gender mainstreaming so in the overall context i would say that the inclusion of women in different levels you know different realms of disaster risk reduction processes from expert to stakeholder levels in participatory processes to increase perspectives uh, is very very important in order to increase the resilience of all levels. Thank you very much. Wow, uh, such a comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, thank you so much, you know, to share your perspective on gender, particularly on disaster risk reduction. So um, uh, I, I think needless to summarize what you've just presented, but I uh, would like to sum up a bit. You know, when after listening to you, you know, I feel like, you know, we should put uh, gender equality and gender um, um, perspective, you know, at the center of our humanitarian response and also disaster risk reduction. I think which is really key. And the another key word that I heard um, a couple times uh, throughout your presentation is uh, EPRP, Emergency Preparedness Response, uh, response Plan, uh, which we need to involve and include all marginalized people, particularly women, um, um, yeah, a lot of the time they are most of uh, most uh, vulnerable groups in the community into this process. And uh, the another keywords that you refer a lot is, is inclusion. I think uh, this one is really, really good that we have to keep an eye when we deliver um, uh, disaster risk reduction interventions you know, at community level. Um, and um, the another approach that I think um, you know, we should uh, explore more um, after this is community-based uh, DRR, disaster risk reduction. So we can, uh, after listening to you, you know, we should reconsider how we can uh, uh, mainstream gender inequality, uh, gender equality uh, concept you know, into community-based uh, disaster uh, risk reduction. I think um, um, this one is, this session is fantastic you unpack a lot you know i feel like i just visited india um you know a rural community in india you show you you visualize us the picture how women are close you know can be the obstacle for them uh during the disaster crisis those kind of things so thank you very much so and and i would like to highlight um one more thing when we are talking about gender um like uh, professor mentioned you know it's not about women only it's all population, it's all genders involved, including LGBTIQ. Uh, 
um, uh, you know, it depends on the context. Uh, so uh, we have to think about these uh, populations as well when we deliver and implement disaster risk reduction, uh, particularly at community community level, yeah, as they are always marginalized uh, population uh, during a disaster crisis. So uh, now uh, we still have time to have a few questions. Um, so uh, I need someone to help me because you know I cannot see the chatting box at the moment on my screen. Uh, so uh, we can. We can address the question in the chat box. Um, can someone help me to read it out? Right. Yeah. Let me provide assistance on that regard. We have two questions in the chat box. The first one from Ms. Putri. It says, thank you so much for the insightful presentation, Professor. As you've said that the disaster is not the one which making the equality, but it is just making it more severe. And as we know that in this particular, particular world, the inequality happened to the women and gender minority groups. But do you have any information regarding how those vulnerable groups can survive through the impact of disaster by themselves? Like the concept of self-resilience of those groups. Yes, thank you, Professor, please proceed. Thank you for the question. I think um, there's a lot of um, essence to the question that has been asked. Because you see, most of the time when we are talking about um, uh, gender equality, <clears throat> we put the onus of uh, giving that gender equality also to somebody, you know, from outside, you know, beyond the agency of the woman. So it is something that is deemed to be again given to the women. Opportunities for equality are, are supposed to be given, you know, and not stemming out of her own agency of procuring or deriving these opportunities. So in that sense, you know, she's very right in saying that, you know, women are disempowered even in terms of, uh, you know, how gender equality is deemed to be given or accessed by them. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, focus that should go into capacity building and of course you have you know the cliched and the stereotypical manner we've always been saying how women's education you know needs to be focused on and sometimes now you know women are also saying that you know we waited long enough for that empowerment to come I mean it, it definitely gender mainstreaming is a very slow and a long pro process it requires a lot of uh, you know um, external inputs to come in but we must focus on building women's own agency you know to 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 tackle some of her vulnerabilities which will only come through an intensive contact that we can build in terms of you know creating women's groups creating dif different types of groups whether they are support groups or they are credit groups or they are skill you know in india there's a lot of skilling which is happening let me say that you know, Prime Minister Modi has focused a lot on skilling because we find that education, <clears throat> not everybody needs an MA degree or a PhD degree or an MPhil degree. You know, people need a skill in order to become financially independent. And there's a lot of focus now on skilling and not skilling in terms of the stereotypical occupations that women were, you know, deemed to do like tailoring, etc. So, so women into geriatric care or into computers or electronics, and all of that, so, so uh, you know, what uh, Sri has uh, put forward is uh, very important that you need to invest in women's capacities. And it's very also important to do, to, you know, uh, somewhere neutralize the resisting stakeholders. For example, when we go and work in villages, you know, there's a lot of opposition sometimes when we try and engage women. Because a lot of times even, and sometimes, you know, women are the worst victims of women. The mother-in-laws, they will always say, you know, why are you taking our daughter-in-law? They'll get used to being out of home. Or the husbands, you know, they will say, oh, you're trying to, you know, create another kind of a, a system in the village. This doesn't work. So a lot of times you need to also balance out, neutralize, convince these resisting stakeholders in order to, in, you know, empower the women to capitalize on their own uh, capacity. So it's very important that let's not wait for the men or the, the political leaders or uh, you know others to give this kind of an uh, opportunity for equity and equality, but let, let the women
women strike for it themselves and there is you know there i i think in india across the states a lot of work is being done for women's groups community based organizations who are giving this kind of a confidence to them nice nice so um do we still have time to take one more question uh Yeah, I think we still have uh, time to to yeah to have another question. Yeah, our colleagues inform us that we have time until twelve fifteen. So yes, I suppose so. Another question in the chat box from Miss Adiva. It says, "I'm so grateful for the awesome and very interesting explanation explanation from you, Professor Nira. I believe that everything relates to the mindset. I just wonder, in your opinion." What is the most important mindset, such as kinds of principles that need to be developed in women, so that women can have more strength to take care and aware of themselves? Okay, right. uh, Professor, please. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for another very good question. Uh, you see, the mindset still is um, deeply embedded in patriarchy, and you know, in uh, when I teach my students, because I teach sociology also. and you know there's something called i wonder if you're familiar with this term called hegemony uh, you know that there there's a hegemony and hegemony you know you don't need to tell women uh, through some coaching classes or through some external stimuli that they are disempowered and i'm i'm not only talking about women i'm talking about all ma- marginalized groups and constituencies that you know you don't have to tell them constantly that they are marginalized they they continuously experience a feeling of vulnerability and marginalization across uh, you know right from when they are born to till the time of their death because you know it is so common sensical to assume that women are subordinate i mean you know i would al- always say you look at your history books and you know you go back into early history and when man discovered fire and when you know uh, uh, potter's wheel was invented and you look at the hands which are doing you know pottery which are holding the pot they are always men's hands right and it was always uh, he you know man never woman i remember when i i just became uh, i was uh, you know the head of the department a little time ago i just completed my tenure and in uh, you know so i was the the board my board under my name my designation was you know in english it translated to head of the department being a male you know it it is adhyaksh in hindi which is a, a a masculine reference to the head of the department and i insisted that i wish to change it and make it into adhyaksha which connotes that i'm a woman right and the university said no this is a gender neutral term right whether for men or women you will use adhyaksha so i just took up my permanent marker i said if the university is not going to give me another board i'm just going to add my you know additional one uh, you know stroke which would make a adhyaksha into adhyaksha myself and 3 years you know that board remained so what i'm again trying to say is that you know it's common sense that people will tell you oh this is a gender neutral term it is common sense you know for women to to say that look if we are working we also have to do household work so so much is not it is so common sensical to be for women to be told that they have a subordinate status one very small example i'll give you you know i ask my men students so many times do you think uh, women in your families are empowered and most of my male students will say Ma- ma'am yes so i'll say okay just give me an illustration what makes you think they are empowered so one boy would usually get up and say ma'am my mother is working so i'll say oh that is an excellent example of empowerment because definitely financial independence so what made her so empowered you know how was she because not too many women can still work so you know the answer usually is ma'am it is because my father is so nice you know he lets her work so if woman for woman to be empowered needs the permission of the husband so i very jokingly i'll always ask her okay so when your dad goes to work does he also seek permission of your mother right so so in so many ways you know this whole uh, idea of Uh, empowerment the way we look at empowerment it is still embedded in patriarchy which is all you know through culture through media you look at advertisements where women will be advertising you know milk powder lactogen all family oriented who's doing the cooking at home the woman 
right? And you look at all kinds of Mac, you know, the the other advertisements where men are selling cars, and so it is all so culture driven. It is also hegemonized that you know you need to break these perceptions that you know I don't cook, my husband cooks, and I tell that in my class, right? Mm -hmm. And women find it surprising, but you need to break these, you know, shatter these. Role models which have persisted for so long. Only then can perceptions change. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. You must be a very good uh, role model, uh, you know, to young generation in India. Um, uh, I think, and your work is very fantastic. Uh, I, you know, thank you so much for um, being with us today. And uh, please give, um, do not be a cloud for our Professor. You know, for. Uh, uh, her excellent work you know, in India, I think, and also across the region. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you indeed for the opportunity, and I, I really uh, loved interacting uh, with you all today. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So for participants who still have questions, please also feel free to you know, leave your questions and comments on the chatting box. We are going to collect all of them uh, relating, relating to this topic, and then we're going to share with uh, Professor. And then we can, you know, uh, chit chat after this. Thank you. So I'll take leave now. Nice. So uh, without further delay, um, I'll be, I would like to um, introduce to uh, all of you the next uh, keynote speaker. Um, in the previous session, we talked uh, a lot about gender and disaster risk reduction, but now we're going to you know, really focus on water resource management um, and uh, water-related risks in light of uh, changing climate. Um, so uh, I would like to introduce to all of you Dr. Uh, Niladri Kupta. Um, he has a PhD. He, he holds a PhD degree in the Department of Geography you must be very good at GIS and you know developing maps, those kind of stuff, and also environmental science. Um, he is now a senior water resources uh, management specialist uh, at Asian Disaster Preparedness uh, Center (ADPC) in short. So he has years of experience uh, regarding climate risk and water resource management. Um, he is with us today uh, to share his perspective on water resources management and water related uh, disaster. So um, uh, Dr. Naladri, the floor is yours. I hope you can hear me. Yes, uh, now and clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to His Excellency Ambassador Budiman and uh, distinguished uh, keynote speakers who have presented participants, ladies and gentlemen. So my presentation, as you know, will mainly focus on water resources and water related uh, disaster management. Uh, we all know that water is the key issue. It has been the key issue always, and it will continue to be the key issue. Whatever disasters we think of, it is always connected to water. So if we do not do a uh, well-defined water resource management, or if you don't do good risk assessments on the water sector, then uh, the time that is coming will be very crucial and uh, for us. So uh, without wasting much time, I will share my presentation. I hope you can see the uh, presentation in full screen mode. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so when we talk of uh, water resources and water related disaster management. The first thing, as you see in the picture, it comes to the flood. This is the 2011 flood that happened in Thailand. But we also have to know that it's not only flood that is water related disaster, it's also the drought. So either it is more water or less water, both is water related disaster. So we, unless and until we have a good water resource management uh, program at national or regional level, uh, then it will be very difficult to manage these disasters. And the second most important thing about water is that whichever part of the globe you go in, water is always transboundary. You will rarely find a river or a system starting in a country and ending in, a, in the same country. It will either start from some other country, flow through a second country and go to the sea in the third country. So as you see in South Asian region, in Southeast Asia, the Mekong River, it starts from somewhere else, 
goes to four countries and then falls into the sea in our fifth country. So in my presentation, I will just uh, give you a short overview about the various hydromet extreme events because that is becoming the focus of the scientific community now. Uh, you must have all attended some of the events in COP26 and hydromet extreme events has always been the focus, has been the focus and uh, people are talking how to manage them. But when we talk of hydromet extreme events, the first thing that we have to keep in mind is water resource management, and in this case, integrated water resource management, which is more of, till now, has been more of a um, theoretical aspect where it's very difficult to find intersectoral collaboration to do this water resource management. Some countries have been success, some countries hasn't been success in, successful in doing it. So this becomes very important. And do we need to see the water resource management or the integrated, integrated water resource management with a climate perspective? The second thing is climate risk management. As Dr. Bichit had mentioned in his initial first presentation, that we need to see the risk management or the risk assessment in a different perspective. So I will speak a bit about climate risk management in a different perspective that ADPC is currently uh, propagating to the communities, communities in the terms, the scientific communities. And lastly, I will also look into the way forward on these two aspects. So first going to hydromet extreme events, if we start from say a few decades ago, so this is a UNDRR report 2018, which says uh, from 1998 to 2017, if you see the percentage of uh, people affected by disasters, you will see two mains are the 2 billion people or 45% in flood and 33% or 1.5 billion in drought. So the two major disasters we all know, you people have been working on disaster management for a long time, uh, either as a student or a researcher. So these two are the major hazards that actually affect people, uh, floods and droughts. But if we just uh, fast forward to 2021, so these are the uh, in 2021, you, these are some of the headlines from the newspapers from June to, say, October this year. So first, we have a drought, which is the worst in 1,200 years, which is which scorched the U.S. and Canada, places which used to have minus temperatures, had heat domes lasting for six, seven days, mm -hmm. and things just burnt out. You may have seen it in the internet. Then in July, it came the floods in Germany. We all see that Germany is the first world country and they have the best disaster response system, early warning systems. But there was a record rainfall, which was never actually thought that this much rainfall can happen in such a short period of time. And within days of the, uh, sorry, uh, within few, one month of the event in Germany, then came in, uh, I mean, so not even one month, within seven days, we come back to the eastern part of the globe and there were 1.2 million people displaced in a record-breaking rainfall in China, where people died standing inside subway trains. Uh, so, and then if we come to October, which is just a few months, uh, last month, and it's still going on in India and Nepal, more than 200 people died due to heavy rainfall and flooding. And till yesterday, there were around 150 people who died in India in southern part because of extensive rainfall, which is unlikely at this time of the year. And if we go back to the COP26, where uh, our Secretary General of the WMO, he actually mentioned all these. He says, months worth of rainfall fell in space of hours in China and parts of Europe. It saw severe flooding, dozens of casualties, and billions of economic losses. And when we go to South America, it's the second successive year of drought, which has reduced the flows of rivers. And obviously, it has affected the agriculture, transport, and the energy production. So when we see all these things, uh, our focus goes to the extreme events. So we have, so if we see from January to July 2021, this is again a data from the floods occurring in the first seven months of this year. If you see Europe was the most affected, followed by Indonesia and that, uh, and that part of the globe and then the South Asia, and then comes the Southeast Asia. So we are the most vulnerable people in the globe now, in the people of this region, and especially Indonesia. So if we look into all these things, then 
the intensification of climate extremes and changing of climate conditions seems to be the new normal. We always talk about COVID-19 and saying that we are staying in the time of new normal. But in addition to COVID-19, another thing which has slowly crept in over the last few years is the intensification of climate extremes and changing of climate conditions. So that is also a new normal which we are living in. A lot of people are living in. And climate change is threatening us all. And water is the primary vehicle through which we will feel the impact, as I said. So it's the same thing. The, either it will be flood or drought. The two extremes is likely to happen. And in most cases, it has been found in the meteorological department databases that the overall rainfall of the year annual rainfall hasn't changed much. But the thing that has changed is the precipitation uh, distribution and the intensity. So that is making all the difference. So we have to have a perspective of how we manage this. So technically, we are, the, we are at a crossroads of climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction in the Asia and the Pacific region. So which one should we take up? Which one should be the priority and how we should do it? So, Coming to this, we are seeing uh, in ADPC and overall, it should be seen in uh, two perspectives, two lenses. One is the integrated water resource management lens, another is the climate risk management lens. So what are these two lenses? Uh, there will be more questions that I will put forward rather than giving solutions, because these are things which are coming up in which we have to manage the system. And as a lot of students are here, where there are master, research, uh, master students, PhD researchers, I think these are the aspects which should be the uh, topic of research in the next few decades. That how do we see change in IWRM or in the climate risk management perspective? Because IWRM is a very old concept of 1960s, but maybe it requires change because of the changing uh, climatic patterns. So when we talk of IWRM, just to give a background of who are not aware of this, it's, there are actually five things which are the components of IWRM, as we say. One is the water regime, which is very important. So, and then it's the relevant users and the sectors. Then comes the policies, priorities, equities, economics and environment, the engagement and governance and the process orientation. So all these five components make up IWRM but the most important component is the water regime. That's what needs to be managed. And definitely the others are also required, but it will be driven by the water regime. So what do we mean by water regime? Water regime is actually the prevailing pattern of water flow availability over a given or specific time. The season, suppose say this is in Cambodia. So you see this place, it's in the dry season, the volume of water available, the velocity and the variability. The same place is in a flooding season, it has a different perspective. So this water regime of the extremes, the lowest and the highest, that has to be taken care of because of the extreme events happen, uh, as we see around. So these water, uh, the water regime was always there, but the climate change has actually uh, had an impact on it. So the question that comes forward, three important questions comes ahead when we are talking in this IWRM concept, the water regime component. Can we extrapolate the past for the future? So whatever past events had happened, is it the act, will it give a clear picture of the future? It's questionable now because the extreme events were not there earlier at such a frequent interval. Uh, so. Uh, should we still carry on that process of extrapolating the past for the future? Can we model the changes in water use based on past water regime? So whatever water was available, the water flow available, availability, seasonal changes in the past, will it be the correct picture of the future? So, so that is another question which comes. The third is that will more frequent and severe extreme events change our normal? So the way that we see either you are it. Will it be the same because the severe extreme events are becoming more frequent? So these questions need to be answered. And honestly speaking, there is still no answers to it because people are still exploring. And we at ADPC are also trying to find ways to actually include the future climates into this uh, water regime calculations or the water regime uh, having a uh, perspective of the water regime. But can we include that or not? That becomes a question. 
So, as I was saying, is IWRM fit for the purpose? So, can we potential futures as a as a basis for IWRM? So, till now, IWRM has always seen the past as the information, uh, past information to generate the future. But the potential futures were never used. But the climate change scenarios and the models coming from various programs like Senate 5, Senate 6, which some of you may have heard. So can we use those models? But again, when we're using these models, will uncertainty overwhelm our approach because these models have uncertainty. So these, all these things need to be uh, taken in future researches so in IW, when we are thinking of the IWRM approach. So some of the elements may be outdated in the IWR and we may need to revamp them with inclusion of potential futures and taking care of the uncertainty. So when we talk of IWRM, this is a report which was published by three months back by UNEM about IWRM implementation level in 2020. And if you see, most of the countries have done at medium low to medium high level. So in Asia, in Africa, South America, or even in North America. So it's medium low to medium high, mainly medium low. So people haven't yet able to conceive the IWRM concept as it exists now. Countries haven't been able to implement. And we are already talking of including future perspectives into it. So are the countries ready for it? And how do researchers, universities, and research organizations help the countries to actually uh, take these uh, studies forward? Because if these researches are done, then only it will percolate to the community, to the government. If these researches don't exist, what are the uh, positives and the negatives of this research, the pros and cons? We cannot uh, actually. Uh, we cannot actually. I think there is some background noise. Sorry. Yeah, uh, we cannot uh, actually uh, think of the future perspective of IWR. We don't. Uh, the current process is not uh, taken up by the government. So why do we? Uh, why I am pressing out for IWR? Why? Why does we need it in the disaster uh, perspective? So human pressure on water resources are increasing uncertainty. We, how many people of us, when we brush our teeth in the morning, we keep our tap closed while we are brushing. It's always open until we finish our brushing. So it's a simple example. If you see, we get up from the bed, we go, we open our tap, we brush, and until until we complete it, we don't close the tap. Very few people do it. So if we Extra, uh, if we extrapolate these to other users, you will see that people are uncertainly using the water. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, climate change impacts are being amplified in the water and power. So we do not have much water till we are using the water uncertainly. What will happen then? And there will be a point of time when we will have no water. Then how do we manage? Then second comes at 2.2 billion. As per data available with uh, UNF. 2.2 billion people actually lack access to safe drinking water. 4.2 billion people lack access to safe sanitation. 2.3 billion people live in water stress countries. And only 24 out of 153 countries have all their transboundary water covered by operational agents. You just imagine, as I was saying, that water is always transboundary in all countries. But out of 153 countries, only 24 have their transboundary water covered under operational arrangement. That means two countries agree between water sharing, how much water will be released during the lean season, how much will be uh, released during the flooding season so that the other country doesn't get affected. So most of the countries don't have some such arrangements. And added to that is water pollution is increasing the, uh, is increasing and freshwater ecosystems are declining. So practically we are in a mess with water. And added to that, if we add the disasters, the climate-induced disasters, the climate extremes, then there, we, they, we have already crossed the tipping point. So compounding these challenges, climate change with increasing water availability, variability, and causing more frequent and extreme floods and droughts is proportionately affecting the most vulnerable. So these are the communities we, we have been talking about. So the system is actually disproportionately affecting the most vulnerable because of the unsustainable use of water. 
compounded with the climate extremes. Now, what are the key management challenges? Why is this happening? The first one, everyone talks about, but there is no solution yet. As I gave you the example, out of 24 countries, 153, only 24 countries have managed. So lack of coordination. So you just imagine that we do not have coordination within our country, between departments, sometimes between ministries. Some countries are doing it. It's a long process. Like uh, one of, uh, like Dr. Pichit was mentioning, that the health department people were sent to work with disaster management department people and disaster management people were sent to health department. So each person knows what the other person is doing and understands the importance. So this lack of coordination has to be reduced. The second uh, thing which is the management challenge is insufficient financing. Because so financing generally goes for a specific sector. But when there is intersectoral collaboration required, then many of the cases it is the least priority of the government. Say, for example, agriculture and water, two ministries, agriculture ministry and water ministry. If the funding, if we say that there will be a funding for coordination between agriculture ministry and water ministry for sharing of water at different seasons, the funding will be minimum for that. The more funding would be on crop varieties, how to support the farmers, and in the water sector, it would be how to manage the floods or droughts. But the coordination wants everyone over it. Then comes the weak capacity of institutions to enforce legislation. This is a big problem because in government departments, it has been seen that people get transferred. Today, the person who is in the agriculture ministry, tomorrow he is in the water ministry. So there is no one is there to actually enforce the legislation. So these type of things really affect the, uh, are the challenges. And third, the fourth and the most important is insufficient monitoring and data and information sharing. Where, which we all always found that we as researchers or any organization, if we want to do a project, the first thing we go and ask for data and they say that give us a letter and we will see if the data is available or not, and how it can be shared, what are the protocols. So uh, luckily we have open source data, but that also has restrictions of scale. So open source data cannot be available at very fine scale. So these type of uh, challenges are there uh, when we talk of IWRA. So, the thing is, the question that I will put forward again to the audience and to the researchers is that do we need to revisit IWRA? I think there is a scope now that we should think about it. And can change in governance approach help? This thing about coordination, financing, there has to be change in the governance approach. So, it's a question the researchers, all new students, need to ponder on that do we need to do this to actually manage the water-related disasters. Now coming to the other aspect of climate risk management. So we talk about the process of IWRM, but climate science and emerging technologies offer unprecedented promises of including and empowering people across the risk, risk scale. So there is the climate science is very ad, advancing at a very high pace. So there are a lot of promises. So I will just give an example which we at ADCC are now uh, working on. It's called the Climate Risk Management, and it's it's part of the global program on risk assessment and management for adaptation to climate change, loss and damage. It's by uh, it's, it's being done by GIZ uh, uh, Germany. Uh, so they have this uh, methodology developed where they look into a cycle. But the cycle starts with the climate risk assessment. And in this climate risk assessment, it's a different from normal risk assessment. In normal risk assessment, what we do is that we based on return periods. That a disaster, how how many, uh, what is the time span of a disaster happening? Is it a 10 year return period or a 50 year return period or a 100 year return period based on past events? But in this methodology, we are not looking into the past events only. We are also looking into the future the future climate models, the future scenarios. Can we actually predict that what will be the frequency of the climate risks or the uh, risk of the, uh, the chances of the hazards happening in the future? At what interval it will happen? So identifying the risk, assessing magnitude of impacts and identifying measures are part of this climate risk assessment. So once when this cycle is complete, the first part of the cycle is done about climate risk assessment, which, which means the new perspective, 
we shouldn't be depending on the past. We should look into the future also. Future in terms of climate models. That's the only future available with us currently. And also taking care of the uncertainties within it. Because future is always uncertain. We do not know what is going to happen one minute from now. So that uncertainty needs to be reduced. So that's the new client risk assessment that Dr. Vicky actually mentioned and told that we will be discussing further in this presentation. So this climate risk assessment, where we incorporate future climate information into the risk assessment, risk assessment, especially into the hazard assessment. So we take from the past and we again project into the future, but not based on the past only. We see the future precipitation and temperature patterns through the climate models and see if the hazard is going to happen at a less frequency or not. And then we do the general risk assessment. And when we go to the vulnerability assessment, the thing is that many of the land use plans or the urban plans actually change. So what is present today will not be there in the future. So those things also needs to be taken into consideration when we are doing the vulnerability assessment or the exposure and things like those to get into the risk assessment. So after we do this risk assessment, then we have to see what kind of climate risk measures to avert, minimize, and address loss and damage we need to take. And then we go to a decision making and implementation phase where we prioritize, monitor, evaluate, and then comes back to the cycle. So in that way, what happens is that that in the first cycle is the most important. The next cycle, you already have the learnings. So you can in update or incorporate in the next cycle of climate risk assessment. So this is the cycle I'm going to a bit into details. So when we talk of climate risk assessment, there are actually two schools of thoughts. One is the climate change adaptation school of thoughts, another is the disaster risk reduction school of thoughts. And both are very important. Uh, my, what I said about the future prospective, it doesn't mean that I am telling that we don't need to think about the past. The past is definitely important, but we shouldn't project the future just based on the past. We should also consider the future into those analysis from the climate models. So climate change adaptation is climate risk. It, it can be a backward looking analysis as well as a forward looking analysis. And when we go to risk assessment, there are two aspects. One is the loss and damage assessment. When we do the loss and damage assessment, one is called post disaster need assessment loss and damage. And after a disaster happens, what losses happen, what damages happen to infrastructure, to crops, to human life. Another is that if we know from the risk assessment that what is going to happen in the future, we already know what we think are likely events, which things are likely to be damaged so that we can protect them. And the broader risk assessment in disaster risk protection is identifying hotspots, like we get those uh, German watch reports every year of the hot world risk index from the German watch, where they say based on the past, that these are the events which have occurred and this was the loss, the economic loss and things like those. So both are very important when we think of climate risk assessment. Both post-ante and ex-ante, means the past and the future. Now, this, there is a six-step approach to doing climate risk assessment. The one that I explained. The one is the analysis of the status quo information, needs and objectives, a hotspot and capacity analysis of system of interest, development of context-specific methodological approach. This is very important because we cannot have one risk methodology for everything. So if we are looking into social risk, if we are looking into not even social, if we go by hazard, every risk assessment on the methodology has to have a customized approach. We cannot have a one solution for everything. And then qualitative and quantitative risk assessment are done. So we have to keep in mind, it's not only the infrastructure risk we are looking or the economic risk we are looking There is something called non-economic loss and damage. So if a flood happens or if a drought happens, uh, there are some losses which you cannot give an economic value. Suppose, for example, in a flood, a hundred year flood comes, and the most important religious place in that village gets washed out, which is like 200 and 300 years old. We cannot put economic value to that. That is a non economic asset. So, how do we incorporate those in the risk assessment? Because that has a huge impact on the uh, people's 
those uh, psychosocial, it has a psychosocial effect on the local community. So that is the religious place which their fathers, forefathers has been worshipping for the 200 and 300 years. And suddenly, because of a massive flood which no one expected, washed it away or damaged it uh, in an unrepairable condition. So these type of non-economic loss and damages, then there is another thing about the mental effect of farmers when their crops get lost due to a huge flood. So you have to put a value, you cannot put a value for that. We give compensation, that's true. Government gives compensation, flood offers. Uh, they say that, oh, you have lost this much of rice, so this is the price you get. But what is the price about the mental health of the farmers who lost everything? Because governments will give based on certain calculations. So each type of non economic asset also needs to be considered as a risk assessment in the new paradigm. And then comes the evaluation of risk tolerance. So how much of tolerance each community have or each member of the community have, like earlier presenter was telling about speaking explicitly about the gender. So this evaluation of the risk tolerance, that the gender becomes very important. Gender, uh, as she was saying, it's not only about women, it's about all gender, all age group, all, uh, uh, so that evaluation of risk tolerance has to incorporate in the risk assessment. But generally what happens is that when we carry out risk assessment, we carry out only of the economic costs. That these many houses are there, in a flood, these many houses are damaged, so this was the area of the house, this was the material of the house based on that, they say that the non economic cost. We never consider the non economic cost. Rarely consider this. And last comes the identification of the feasible options to avert, minimize, and address. So if you do this risk assessment for the future, you can actually have an idea of how to avert, minimize, and address the loss and damages. So if we zoom in the second part, which is very important about the major or flood hazards or water related hazards. So all cannot be done at the uh, uh, at the community level or at the country level because climate risks do not generate at the country. It's transboundary. Suppose say if there is a heat wave or a flood occurring in any country, you do not say that it's because the climate the climate change is only in a island or only in Indonesia. Climate change is in the region or maybe at the global scale. So we always say that the uh, Western world is emitting more and uh, countries affected are in the eastern part of the globe. So mitigation and sustainable development has to be taken at global level so that small countries don't get affected or countries do not emit as much as the other countries that are getting affected. Like say, I have definitely, I don't have the value, but Indonesia is definitely not the emitter, but the most, one of the most affected countries. Similarly, Bangladesh, the Pacific Island country. So those measures have to be taken at global level. But when we took to talk of local level, then there are some proven things and making the adaptation instruments which may we may consider. And these are the mean tools and tech adaptation instruments which are being sought around. One is the climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, another is risk finance, insurance, and transformational approach. This transformational approach is very important because there is a limit to adaptation. We may say that we have adaptation measures, but we don't know the extreme event, the flood or the drought that's going to happen, and whether that adaptation measure will at all work or not, or up to what threshold it will work. So beyond that threshold, you cannot have any more adaptation. In that case, you have to do transformational approach. An example being a community staying by the side of the river. So you can increase the embankment of the river up to a certain level and save the community by relocating them to a safer place and then again back to the place where they belong. But suppose say the extreme floods are becoming more frequent where it's not possible for the communities to be relocated and um, brought back again to the place where they lived. So in that case, you have to relocate them permanently to a different place. So these are transformational changes and it takes time. So these are also some of the things we need to look into because of these extreme events that are happening. So always, as we say, there is no one solution. So it's a combination of financial instruments and tools. When we talk of adaptation and here are strategies in water resources, water related disasters. And it's in fact applicable for all disasters, but as we are talking about water related disasters here, so I'm focusing more on water 
So it has to be a social protection plus climate risk insurance, risk plus, uh, plus risk reduction. So it has to be a combination of this financial management and climate adaptation and the other strategies. Now, how do we do these risk transfers? So there are two types of uh, events that we are talking about. One event is about the extreme uh, weather, means the fast onset events like floods, which happen suddenly. So in that case, there can be two types of adaptations or risk resilience measures to build the resilience of communities. One is through insurance. So you can do insurance, it may be at government level, it can be at global level, or any, uh, it can be micro insurance, it goes to say, uh, to uh, lower administrative uh, areas, like community level is even. But insurance is not the only solution. Insurance also has a limit. So suppose say if you are giving flood, insur flood insurance to a crop land, or an agricultural crop land, so when the flood affects the crop, they would be to give the insurance coverage, right? But if there is a flood which permanently damages the land and you cannot grow the crop anymore, so that insurance no more becomes valid because you cannot give an insurance for a product which doesn't exist. So in that case, insurance cannot be the only solution. The prevention comes into the picture. So in prevention, you have to do risk analysis, the one that I just now mentioned about new methodologies that we call to be future climate extremes. Then funding for prevention like flood early warning systems or drought early warning systems and then contingency plan. But when we are talking of slow onset events like droughts, we cannot talk of insurance. Insurance shouldn't be the first tool because droughts are slow onset events. And besides droughts like Drought, actually, we shouldn't say it's a slow onset because now even F triple C doesn't consider drought as a slow onset event. But um, multiple times of drought leads to desertification. Or suppose the sea level rise, ocean acidification, glacial retreat. These are slow onset events. A glacial retreat takes a long time, or desertification happens after multiple times of droughts happen. So in that case, if you give insurance as an option, it will not work because no insurance companies or entities will insure for an indefinite period because they do not have any calculation of where it is going to end. So in that case, we have to go with your adaptation mechanisms. Like if it's desertification, then funds for irrigation systems, resilient species, if it's sea level rise, then funds for such protection. If it is ocean acidification, then compensation of losses for fisheries. And then if glacial retreat, then funds for water retention system and flood control. Because if there is glacial retreat, there will be something called drop, glacial lake out or flow, which is called massive floods, which generally happen in the Himalayan region. So you have to have water retention systems and flood control. So this is how you transfer the risk. Uh, then, then social protection. Sometimes it happens that government schemes, suppose say insurance is not possible because every country cannot have those. Or suppose say some of the measures, uh, physical measures are also not possible. So I means funds are not available. In that case, there are government schemes that provides cash or food aid to the vulnerable or the food insecure household households in exchange of labor and public work products that can be relieving to the communities with disasters as a whole. So what happens is that uh, suppose say our area is flood affected or drought affected. Let's take an example of drought, the less water. So you need water harvesting structures. So the government, if there is a drought, there are two options. One is the government builds the water harvesting structures with their own money and also give compensation to the affected community. So money has to be paid twice, one for building the infrastructure and another for compensating the losses of the affected community. But instead, in some countries, what they are doing is that governments are making a scheme in which the affected communities build the water harvesting structures themselves as part of the project, and they get a daily wage for that. So in that case, the government actually saves money, and also the climate resilience benefits are all developed by the communities themselves, like soil, water or soil conservation, irrigation improvement, restoring water bodies. So this can address both slow onset and extreme events. So this is 
not popular everywhere in the globe, but uh, this is a way of giving social protection. This happens in, in South Asian countries, in Bangladesh, in India, the schemes run, and I am not aware if there are some similar schemes in ASEAN countries, but this is a way of actually uh, helping the communities develop their own assets and also get paid for it. And there can be insurance and added to it. So, but as I said, there are sometimes underfunded, but governments are focusing on this to save money. Now, how do we actually uh, do this? Uh, so, identifying the uh, right risk. So, if you see this graph, the x axis is the uh, risk uh, options and the y-axis is the return period. So it's a high frequency low impact event to a low frequency high impact event. So what type of uh, measures we should take? So it's uh, there are something if it's a low frequency or a high impact event, then sometimes some supports are beyond the limit, limit of adaptation. It's a very high risk and some and more we go towards the top, the government has to support. And more we come towards the lower part, then risk financing or risk reduction uh, measures are, are becoming relevant. So we have to make a trade-off that based on the extreme events that are likely to happen in the future and the frequency like increase, how the governments or the uh, responders to these events, uh, how they need to plan the uh, risks. So whether it should be a government donation, a public donation of post-disaster uh, assistance, or it should be a risk financing, which is more appropriate if risk reduction is not cost efficient. So based on the risk, low risk, medium risk, high risk, and very high risk, we have to see whether we can support the risk management or we can absorb the risk. So absorbing risk has to be done by the government and supporting risk management should be various adaptation measures. And this and if we do the risk assessment, the climate risk assessment uh, correctly with enough data and information about the future, then we can beforehand know how much fund we actually need to manage these future extreme events. So coming to the last part of my presentation about the way forward, where I talked about two things. One is the climate integrated water resource management, another is the uh, climate risk uh, management. So, what I we see here in ADPC and what we are all also doing as part of our research with the uh, in various projects is climate inclusive integrated water resource management because water resource management approaches need to incorporate predicted future changes in climate and result in increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events of a new normal. So, we are already in the new normal of extreme events. So we have to update our IWR and approach. It needs to be revisited, not only from the climate change perspective, but also the changing rules of actors and governance and building water resilience and achieving water security in the future. And there has to be strengthening the link between users and the groups projecting and forecasting weather events. So it sometimes happens that projection is there, the forecast is there, but it doesn't reach the community. So that is very essential and become the scientific community, the organizations are working towards it. It's much better than one what it was say, a decade ago, but still more needs to be done because the extreme events are becoming bigger. And the community needs to be more closely involved with issue inclusion, but also a driver to develop approaches and solutions for the of the user. So unless and until we involve the communities in this risk reduction measures or the disaster major, uh, management measures, it will be very difficult. So even if there is political will, even if there we have data, we have systems, everything done, if the community is not closely involved in the process, we will not be able to give the correct solution. So thank you very much for uh, your patient hearing. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Asian Academic Society, uh, International Conference organizers for giving me the opportunity to present and the Indonesian Students Association. Thank you. Wow, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Milaje is such a comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, personally I learned a lot you know, uh, from, your, uh, from your presentation. 
um, particularly around you know the um, uh, climate risk uh, management um, uh, measure, you know the CRM that you just mentioned. It's a very comprehensive tool, and I think um, uh, most countries uh, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, civil society organizations and governments, you know, we can apply, you know, and, and explore more for it. And then, and thanks, uh, you know, you mentioned a lot about um, you know risk assessments uh, to enlighten us, you know, how. Uh, what is the good uh, assessment should look like and you know and there are many good tools and frameworks out there as well you know to assess uh, for example flood risks uh, climate risks uh, disaster uh, risks uh, for example and um, the another essential part from uh, your presentation that I would like to reflect and highlight again is the risk transfer uh, which is really really um, it's paramount you know in um, DRR uh, in disaster risk reduction, and uh, you mentioned about insurance, which is let me think about my government and you know the practice here in Thailand that you know we should uh, do more and improve it more. You know, um, particularly in light of uh, uh, impact of climate change, and you mentioned also the COP twenty six. Um, we still have hope, even it's quite little, but you know we still have hope. Uh, I learned from COP26 that, you know, even we implemented what we committed in our national determined contribution, the temperature will, will, will rise like 2.4 Celsius degree. Um, but in the best case scenario, you know, we implement every target we announce, you know, in the old strategies up until today. So the best case scenario is still 1.8, which means, um, you know, it's a nightmare for everyone, particularly this corner of the world, Southeast Asia. So we're going to suffer more um, on floodings, droughts, uh, that, uh, that Dr. Naladri mentioned. It's going to be a big issue. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Naladri, uh, to, to walk us through, you know, this uh, issue, you know, water resources uh, management in light of the impact of COVID-19 plus climate change uh, impact. So, um, do we have questions, comments? Yeah, you can raise your hand using uh, the raising, raising hand options, as well as you can leave your questions and comment on the chatting box. As, as far as, as, I, as I see, I haven't seen any question in the, in the chat box yet. Hmm. Um, if none, uh, maybe I, as a moderator, I also have a question myself <laughs> because I'm conducting my research around this topic as well. Um, you know, I'm applying City Resilience Index uh, from UNDRR and Rockefeller Foundation to assess uh, the flood risks um, you know, at provincial level at uh, Pranakonsi and Utilia province. And I keep an eye on this issue for a while and now I'm learning about you know, the new technology called quantum computing uh, technology, um, many experts say it's going to change, you know, uh, the world uh, completely, particularly when we apply this technique, technology into our DRR, we can have a better uh, forecast, um, you know, uh, and we can plan a bit, we can, uh, we can have a better plan in responding and mitigating risks. So, uh, do you want to, would you like to <laughs> elaborate more, you know, on this, um, new coming technology, you know, in the world of DR. Yeah, uh, see, uh, the main issue for all of us is information at the correct time, right? How mm -hmm. fast we can get the information? What is the lead time we are sending the information to the community or to even the first responders so that people's life can be saved? So right. the main target is to save people's life, right? Because you cannot save our agricultural field. You can adapt to it by growing a different variety of, say, a crop where it is regularly flooded. But saving human life is very important, as you have seen. So data processing becomes very important. How fast you can process data. Uh, so that's why, uh, like, artificial intelligence and things like these, like, uh, uh, what you call the Internet of Things, these are coming into disaster risk reduction measures. So I think uh, this is definitely the future, and uh, there are a lot of research going on it. And recently, I, I don't know if you are aware that we 
people are saying that we don't even need weather station. It's the mobile signal which can tell us that uh, how much rainfall is actually happening in a particular area. So the mobile towers would become uh, like weather stations for at least for the rainfall parameter. Because if there is a high rainfall happening in an area, the mobile towers will actually have, the signals will have a fluctuation in it. And that will give us an idea about how much rainfall is happening in a particular area. So data collection becomes more uh, easy or say uh, inexpensive in the terms that we don't have to keep a separate uh, rain gauge if there is a mobile tower there. And mm -hmm. as far as my knowledge goes, Ericsson is extensively trying that technology so that the mobile towers are everywhere. Wherever you look around 50 degrees, you can find innumerable mobile towers. So you yeah. can imagine that data availability will become more easier. And when we are talking about extreme events of rainfall or no rainfall happening in both cases, this uh, type of technology will be very useful. But the uh, important part is that this will be concentrated to certain sections of the society in terms of companies. Uh, so how to make this available open source, that will become more important because it will be the researchers who will slowly develop, understand the data, learn about this and go into the system for doing the various measures in their professional life. But if the students don't get access to these or the way of using these, then it's of no use of generating those data. So we may have Internet of Things, we may have lot of uh, other technologies available, but the most important is that capacity building on using these, especially for the research community, the student community at the correct time, so that when they are ready for their professional life, they already know those things and it becomes easier for the management. True. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, you know, your answer, I think your answer is connect the dots uh, very well uh, with the previous session, you know, when uh, Professor Nirat mentioned that we need to strengthen capacity of uh, you know, marginalized group to access to uh, information, to access to uh, technology, um, you know, which can um, you know, strengthen the capacity to avoid, to adapt, and to minimize uh, the risks from uh, disasters. So that, and the beach, we should not uh, do things in silo anymore. We have to, um, you know, uh, our works should complement to each other, you know, and, and, to achieve the, the entire goal to reduce uh, loss and damage and um, you know to be able to adopt adapt and mitigate uh, from uh, 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 disasters uh, as much as can can yeah like yeah it's back better right same like framework those kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. 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 Well, but, but, but the interesting part is that whenever we go to any conferences or any meeting we always talk about coordination right that yeah. In the last, in the uh, in the message of the uh, completion of the conference, it's always written better coordination is required. But I think uh, that has crossed the limit also. We shouldn't be telling anyone better coordination. We should tell that why it is not happening. It has to happen. If we do not have the coordination, then all these transboundary issues, disaster risk reduction, we don't know that. Because I will be dependent on you to get some information, and you will be dependent on me. And if I do not give you, then you are stuck. So, yeah. So this coordination becomes very important and it has to start very vigorously. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So do we have patients? No, none. Uh, after yes. what we can do the session. Um, thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Anil Adri and also uh -huh. Mr. Nira. You know, this session is very comprehensive and inspiring particularly for young generation, I, I guess, um, you know, to keep doing this thing, um, you know, because no time and no choice, you know, for young generation to fight for it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please no, keep hang in there. Uh, keep a big part, a part. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Dr. Kashid would like, would like to ask a question. Ah, okay, please. Yeah, please. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Well, sorry, I joined in the middle because of some engagement. Uh, I have a question about uh, a general question because I'm not from the field. I'm in the food science and technology, yeah. currently postdoctoral fellow in Thailand. 
So, uh, is there any advancement in uh, predicting that a disaster will come in, I mean, in a short time or before 10 days or 5 days? Like a prediction of the disaster, is there any technology developing in that sector? In that uh, prediction of disaster actually uh, doesn't happen. The disaster the actually is the hazard, prediction of hazard will happen. So, uh, so in that case, we have something called S2S, which is a short range forecasting. We can say that whether extreme rainfall is going to happen or not. And it can be three days, five days, ten days, and even one month. And uh, uh, the extreme precipitation events can actually be passed. So, as I gave the example of the German flood this year, actually the EPMWS, so the European Commission Forecasting Center, which actually ten days before the event, gave prediction that there will be an extreme unprecedented rainfall in that region wherever it happens. And the disaster management authority was informed about it. But no one expected that it would be a hundred year event. No one meant the disaster response again. That's why enough uh, measures were not taken, and that's why it seems to be affected. But regarding forecasting, there is already established uh, technology which act, uh, actually did forecast about rainfall patterns, temperature patterns, heat patterns in a 10 to 15 day ahead of time. And that's how. Like as you are from the food side, so you must be aware of the models like GPAX and other crop prediction models, crop productivity prediction models. So those models actually incorporate weather information. Thank you very much for your Yeah, I hope I answered answer. my query. You're very Yeah. Great. So thanks once again, everyone, um, uh, keynote speakers and participants for your Kai attention. So I'm going to hand over to our MC uh, for more information um, you know, of the next session. Thank, Thank you so you much. Much. Thank you. Thank you very much for Professor Nira Agnimitra and Dr. Niladri Gupta for the keynote speech. It is such a great speech and Mr. Pichel for leading our second discussion. Next. Uh, for attendees, please have a short break until 13.20 and followed by a parallel session. For parallel session, we will be shared in breakout room prepared by the committee, so please wait for the committee to divide all of you into the designated rooms. Thank you. We will come back soon. Look at this view. Oh, it's so beautiful. The Komodo, the last real dragon on Earth. Hi, Ben. Yes, Ben. Hey, guys. You ready to go? I'm super ready. Yeah, see you then. I'm on my way. It takes months to make ulos. This is the famous Toto dance. Prove it and see for yourself. 
I'm in Jakarta, Modern City. You know guys, Jakarta has 47 museums that you can visit. Now, I'm going to meet my friend. Wow. Mm. This mask, they believe can fight them from bad things. I'm in Mario Bono Street. I'm trying to do batik here. Guys, it's called Wayang Kuli, UNESCO World Heritage. dragon on earth. Enjoying this beautiful morning. Let's find a world-class underwater paradise. Hey, turtle! <laughs> I want to roll around in this pink cotton candy sand.